Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending our webinar. They're co-hosted by 12 Points and MFS about protecting your data and your identity. Uh, aware and prepare is the, is the topic. Um, I'm going to give folks a few minutes just to, just to get on, maybe three, four minutes, and then I'll uh, introduce Doug and myself, and we'll, we'll get underway. Okay, I know I said I was going to wait for three or four minutes. I can't, I can't wait any longer. I'm too excited. So good afternoon again, everyone. Uh, thank you for attending our webinar uh, that's co-hosted by 12 Points and MFS on protecting your data aware and prepare. My name is Jeff King. I'm a wealth advisor and financial planner with 12 Points Wealth Management. Been in the business for about 20 years. Uh, prior to that, I was in the software space, so this is particularly interesting to me, this topic. Uh, our, our host and presenter today is Doug Orton. He's a senior biz development, business development excuse me, strategist at MFS, and I'll let Doug tell you a little bit more about himself. Awesome. Thanks, Jeff, and thanks, everybody, for joining us today. As Jeff said, I'm a I'm an employee of MFS and we're an investment company, but one of the things that we're really passionate about is helping advisors and their clients with all the other things in their life that might, you know, be something they want help with, things that might cause stress or distract them from the things they need to focus on. And data protection was really one that we started to look at in terms of a presentation like this just because all the work we were doing as a company to protect ourselves from data loss. So what we're gonna go through today are what some of the scams that you might wanna look out for are, and more importantly, how to protect yourself from falling victim to those scams. And you can use those protections in a lot of different ways. If you own your own business or you're just an individual trying to protect your data, all these things are very effective. There was a study not too long ago by Verizon that was looking at uh, corporate uh, data breaches and they found that the overwhelming majority came from employees getting hacked, either falling for phishing scams, having weak passwords, all those sorts of things. So what we're gonna share today can protect you in a wide variety of ways. And from a personal perspective, I've actually fallen for a few uh, phishing scams, so I can help uh, tell you how to avoid those. Luckily for me, they weren't real. My company does fake phishing attempts uh, at the company every once in a while, just so that we're focused on it. I have failed that test twice, so <laughs> we'll use some of that experience to help you all out as well. So the first thing we want to talk about is what are the things that a data scammer might be trying to get? 
And I know when you look at this example here, not all of this is gonna be in your wallet or your, your purse, your handbag, whatever. But the reason I like using this as an example is if you think about if I got my pocket picked and somebody grabbed my wallet, what are the things that would be really devastating to have lost versus the things that would be you know, mildly inconvenient? Friend of mine was traveling overseas a while ago and, and she got into a cab that didn't take credit cards. And she was talking about how she didn't carry cash because she had been worried about pickpockets. Uh, she was in Paris at the time. And to me, cash, particularly the amount that I might carry around, isn't what I'm really worried about. If I get my wallet stolen and I lose you know, $100 in cash or whatever, that's a very definitive loss that I can recover from. But my driver's license not only do i have to get that back but now somebody has information that would be very helpful for them stealing my identity same thing about my credit cards or my debit cards now i don't carry a debit card i might talk about that a little bit later but the first thing i'm going to recommend you consider today is only carry the things that you need the idea that somebody might carry their social security card with them on a day-to-day -day basis, there's really no reason. I think in my entire life, I've needed that card maybe four times, You know, each time I've had a new job. We don't want to people to have access to those things that are really important to us. And the last one I'll point out here in terms of personal photographs, yeah, somebody steals your wallet, they get a personal photo, that's not a big deal. But when we start talking about protecting your computer, for a lot of us, if we, not that maybe somebody else got access to those family photos, but if we lost those family photos permanently, that would be devastating. So let's talk about what we're gonna do today. We're gonna talk about the types of threats and attacks. I'm gonna break those up by digital, direct, and hybrid attacks. And that's really the delivery method. What you'll see is that many of the attacks are the exact same thing that might be coming from different directions. We're gonna talk about prevention tips. And then lastly, we're gonna talk about what you might wanna do if you've fallen victim to one of these scams. So let's talk about direct threats first. This is going back to what I talked about in terms of you might get your wallet stolen or your, your purse snatched. Anything that you're thinking about in terms of lost actual physical property, we would consider a direct that somebody stealing your mail or um, phone calls and voicemails that you're getting direct attacks. And in terms of lost or stolen property, carrying your checkbook on a day to day basis isn't something that I think is really necessary in today's day and age. Personally, what I do. I only carry checks when I know I'm going to need one, and I don't carry my entire checkbook. I actually put two checks in my wallet, and the reason I use two is originally I would only carry one check when I was going somewhere where I needed, I knew I needed to write one, but then I wrote the check out to the wrong person. I used the electrician's uh, name versus company name, and then I had to go back and get another check. So I carry two that way. If something happens, I lose those. I don't have to stop my, uh, tell my bank to stop all the checks in the checkbook, just one. Credit and debit cards. This is a contentious topic when I bring it up. There are advantages to debit cards over credit cards, particularly when you think about budgeting, but from an identity theft or a, really theft in general, debit cards. You want to limit? Hey, Doug, you just dropped out a little bit. As you're going around, and hey, the other Doug. thing is, yeah, Doug, uh, you just dropped out on my side for about 15 or 20 seconds. Do you want to just back up a little bit? I don't know if everyone else had that experience, but let's assume they did. Okay. 
So was I in the middle of my diatribe against debit cards? Yes, you were you were just getting okay. into that. Yep. Okay. So a lot of people prefer debit cards because they for budgeting purposes, right? You can't spend more money than you actually have. I a hundred percent get that. But from a theft perspective, debit cards give you less protection than a credit card because somebody can get into your actual bank accounts through it. So just something to consider. And then I'll reiterate again, carrying your social security card with you when you don't need it, not a great idea. One of the things you really wanna protect as much as possible is your social security number. So limit what you carry. Then also think about storing your important items in a safe. The one caveat I would throw onto that is for your important documents like a healthcare proxy or healthcare power of attorney or your passport, keeping those in let's say a safety deposit box would certainly be safer, but not generally a good idea because those are things you might need suddenly and you might need when the bank is closed. So for your healthcare proxies and things like that, personally, I keep those on my phone in a locked app so that they're safe. People can't access them without the appropriate password. But if I need them in an emergency, I have them. And then going paperless, the less things that show up in your mail are just less opportunities for people to steal bank account records and, and all that sort of stuff. I know initially a lot of us, particularly my age, we thought that, you know, the electronic was less safe than getting our statements in the mail. And that's not necessarily true anymore. So when we think about mail scams, Mail theft is, is one of them, but what I would look out for in particular are things that don't pass the smell test. When you get mail, or we'll talk about email in a second, that's asking you to reconfirm personal data, or you get a check from somebody that you don't think you should have gotten a check from, those are all things that you want to be aware of. If it doesn't seem right, it probably isn't. There's zero reason that Elon Musk is going to send you a check. You get something like that, it's most likely uh, a scam. So reducing your junk mail is a good way to cut down on that and a locked mailbox where, you know, the mail carrier can put mail in but you can't take it out without unlocking it can be a good idea and then here it says informed delivery through the post office i i'll mention it i don't actually think it's something that most of us are willing to do but if you wanted to there is a service you can set up with the post office where it will send you images of what you should be receiving each day so that you can then compare what you got versus what you were supposed to get. To me, that seems like a little more work than I'm willing to do. I'd rather just use a locked mailbox so people can't steal my mail. Now, getting into phone scams, these are a little more common, or at least my perspective, I get a lot of these. The IRS, the FBI, Social Security, this is the call I get all the time. What we want to think through is the IRS, if they call you, the messages I get tend to have really bad grammar. That's not realistic. It's not generally going to be a recorded call. And anytime a government agency is going to ask you for something like a gift card, that's 100% a scam. And I, I hate even having to say it, but the fact that people will pose as the FBI or Social Security and ask people for gift cards means somebody's actually sending them gift cards. Anything that seems a little weird probably is. Technical support, Here's one that I didn't fall for, but came really close to falling for. Our internet went down one Sunday night and caused complete panic in my household. I use 
the internet all day, every day for business. My wife does as well. My son was studying from home at the time. So we went into full panic mode. My wife's Apple products were still working. So she Googled a Netgear support because it was a Netgear router that we have and clicked on the first link that popped up in the Google search and called them. And the conversation didn't seem quite right. At one point, they were talking to us about how now that it was out of warranty, you know, malware might be installed on it, things like that, which just didn't seem right. So we just hung up on them and then looked at the site. And where we had gone was netgears.com, not netgear. Dot com. So fake technical support is a big scam. And I don't even think it was the money they were going to ask us for. But my guess is what they would have tried to do is remote access the computer themselves. Charity scams are a big one, particularly when we have large disasters that hit the national news. So think about the hurricanes that we just had. A lot of scammers will make fake phone calls or send out fake text messages about those posing as the Red Cross or posing as small local charities. And the protection measure I'm going to bring up again and again today, you're going to get sick of me saying it, is initiate the contact yourself so let's say you get a text message from the red cross asking for a donation because of the the hurricane and you decide yeah i'd like to to donate to that one thing you can do is don't respond to that text message because that may or may not be real go to the red cross site or whatever charity it is that you want to support and make the donation that way because then if that was a real text from a real charity, doesn't really matter. You still made the donation anyway, but if that was a scammer, you didn't get scammed and the money went to the right place. Lastly, I would say travel awards and timeshare deals. Those happen all the time. Uh, either people trying to help you unload your timeshare is sign you're dropping out Doug it sounds like um, internet connection problem this is brutal hey, hey Doug I'm back yeah now you're back so okay. I'm not sure what's Sorry happening in your Wi-Fi issue yeah so let me back up a, a couple of seconds here and say one other good step to protect yourself is sign up for the do not call registry. The less spam calls that you get, it's easier to concentrate on eliminating the scams. I actually set it up on my cell phone because we don't have a landline anymore that any unknown number automatically goes to voicemail. My phone doesn't even ring if they're not in my contact list. Now, sometimes this is a hassle because somebody I did want to talk to gives me a call and it won't even ring. But my thought is a real person calling me will leave me a voicemail and I can call them right back. The scammers never leave a voicemail. I probably have seven or eight calls every day that it puts them into voicemail because they're an unknown number. They're not in my contacts and they don't leave a number or a message, to me that tells me they were either a scammer or a spammer. Either way, it's I'm glad that I don't have to deal with it. So let's move on to digital threats. And this could be emails, this could be compromised websites. We're gonna talk about public Wi-Fi and we're also gonna talk about text messages. The First thing about emails is the scams that I just talked about in terms of mail scams and phone scams, some of those are gonna come by email. Use the same strategies I just talked about. Initiate the contact yourself. 
anything that seems weird probably is weird. And then in addition to that, let's look at what they're doing. So as a quick little fun exercise here, see if you can tell the difference between these two email addresses. Now, this one I eventually got, but it's that one of these is an O and one of these is a zero in Amazon. So scammers will send emails from what looks like a real web address, but isn't. Our next example here, let's pull that up. If you can tell the difference here, one is from the customer complaint department at Apple. The second one is the customer compliant department at Apple. And then we're to our last one. This is the one that I had to go to the cheat code to figure out what it is. Most of the audience never gets this. But here in Walmart, one of these is a capital I and one is a lowercase L. That's so, the most evil one I've ever seen. Oh, uh, it's really hard to tell the difference. Even when I know that that's the exact problem, it's hard you to really see. really can't discern it. Yeah, that's something. And one of the things that, that I would point out for emails is, one, I'm not suggesting that you really look closely at each email sender address to see if it's right. That seems to me like a lot of work. So we'll go back to first step. What I've found is cleaning out my email when I'm tired or when I'm just using my phone or a combination of the two, that's when I actually fell for those fake phishing attempts from my company. So what I decided to do, because I spend a lot of time in airports, I don't want to just not clean out my emails like that, but I made a rule for myself that if it's late or if I'm tired or I'm doing it on my phone, I'll delete spam emails, but I won't respond to any or click to anything. And so that way I can still be productive if I'm sitting waiting for a plane because I can delete a bunch of spam emails, but when I'm tired and I'm looking at a small screen, that's when I might make a mistake not thinking about it. So I'm not gonna respond to anything. I'm not gonna click on anything. I'm only gonna delete. So just a thought that you might wanna do. And then I'll go back to, if something does look legitimate and it looks like you need to respond to it right away, there's no reason you need to respond through the email they just sent you. You get an email from your credit card company and you think, oh, this is, this looks legit. Call the phone number on the back of your credit card. Because if that was a real fraud alert that you got by text or email, doesn't matter. You call the number on the back of your card, you'll get to the same people. You'll be able to address the problem. But if it was a scam, now you'll know and your credit card company will know but if you responded to the email, now you've responded directly to the scammers and you're in trouble. So some of the email scams that you wanna look out for, fake invoices are one that target a lot of businesses right now. And it's almost evil genius. There was a article I saw a month or two ago about a guy who just started sending hundreds of invoices to large companies. And the response wasn't huge, but occasionally these really large companies that you've heard of would pay like a $7,000 bill for a consulting service just because he sent it to their accounts payable, somebody paid it. So just make sure that anything that you get is legit. Suspicious activity is a very common one for uh, credit card companies. And then surveys. Fake surveys are actually really dangerous. Nowadays, they're coming through websites and texts more often than emails. But there was one I was reading about the other day. It was actually targeting, uh, I assume, kids because they're these little, not contests, but it was like this little website thing where figure out what your elf name is. It was around Christmas. 
And what it asked you to do is use your month of birth and your day of birth, and then it would tell you what the funny name was or whatever. It's just a way to figure out what your birthday is. Same as they might say, uh, you know, your whatever name, the, the street that you grew up with, plus your, the, your first car or whatever. They're looking to get the answers to the questions that you use for security. Anything that's trying to get to your birth date, your uh, street you grew up on, first school, first pet name, all of those things sound silly, but it is easy for us to fall for. And a lot of these scams are targeting younger people and older people who might not be as aware of technology. Free trials, some of those aren't even, I think, necessarily legally scams, but you know, the idea you sign up for a free trial, it's not really free uh, if you don't cancel and you never do, so that can be a, a problem. So how do you protect You want to be extra You're dropping, Doug. Just, just don't click it. Access the same company or organization directly through another means. So let's get on to malicious website. One thing that you want to look for is misspellings in the URL. Things that are new tend to be or can be scams, and anything that looks off, grammar mistakes, spelling mistakes, the contact information looks weird. But where I would go here is when things don't seem quite right, they probably aren't. My daughter, this was probably two years ago, my daughter's a nurse, and she came home after work one day and was talking about um, one of the scrubs companies that you know was the one that they all liked they happened to be the most expensive scrub mm -hmm. company was running a 50 percent off sale for national nurses week and she said it was a little weird because she went to their main website and they didn't mention it and so we pulled everything up and what was weird is the link that she got through her tufts uh, email address it looked like the exact website I, it was perfect but then when you went to their main website through just looking at it at google it looked exactly the same but did not mention the sale and that's what triggered her this doesn't seem right why would a company that primarily sells to nurses not advertise a sale for nurses week on their main website so she decided not to click any of the links or buy through that site and some of the people on her floor did and what happened was they sent you know they paid for the merchandise nothing ever showed up what had happened was a scammer copied the actual code for the website and duplicated it that's why it looked so good because it was the same code they had just stolen uh, off of, of the main site. Public Wi-Fi. This one is, I spend most of the time I use public Wi-Fi, I'm in an airport. And the part that I find troublesome right now is even a couple of years ago, when I went to an airport, there was one public Wi-Fi site that I could look at. Last week I was flying and there were like 15 half of them you don't even know what they are so be real careful on public wi-fi and there's two things that i'm going to suggest you do if you want to be absolutely or most secure you can use a virtual private network that's what i use on all my business uh programs that gives you a level of protection on my personal stuff what i decided to do was first i'm careful about what Wi-Fi network I use, but I limit what I access. 
So if I'm in the airport and I want to download some shows from Netflix to watch on the plane, I don't worry about that too much because if my Netflix account gets hacked, the risk is relatively low. It actually happened to us a couple of months ago. Uh, my wife started getting all these emails from Netflix about an added user and a password change. And somehow somebody got into our account, added themselves as a user, and then changed our password. Amber fixed it. My, my wife's name's Amber. She fixed it. Didn't cost us anything. And if we had missed it, it would have cost us $7.99. So I'm not too worried about those sorts of things. But on public Wi-Fi, I will not access my bank or my brokerage account or my 401k or any of those things that if somebody accessed that, that would be a big deal. So just something to consider. When you're somewhere where you're not 100% sure it's secure, think through what would be the implication of somebody accessing this account? For me, somebody sees what I watch on HBO Max, I don't really care. They somehow hack that system. Fixing it might be a hassle, but the risk is low. Somebody gets access to my 401k, that would be a huge problem. So something to keep in mind when you're on public Wi-Fi. Moving on to text scams. I don't want to belabor this one because the same scams that we've been talking about coming through email, phone calls, your mail. Now they just come through text as well. So just use the same strategies we talked about. The big ones being things that don't seem right probably are wrong and initiate the contact yourself. I get texts from my credit card about scams or bills that are due or anything like that they're almost always legit i'm still not going to click or respond to that number i'm going to call the number on the back of my credit card initiate the contact that way and one really good tip that i forgot to mention in the phone section is if you're on the phone with somebody let's say they say they're from the irs and you say, I'm not really comfortable with this. I'm going to call my local IRS office uh, and, and talk to them. If the person you're talking to gets angry and tries to talk you out of that, that is a huge red flag. I've worked customer service before where I had to call people. And if somebody said, oh, I'm going to call back your company in a couple of minutes, I never got mad about that. Why would I be mad? It actually meant I could close the call, get credit for it, and be done. It actually helped out my stats. Somebody you're on the phone with that gets really angry or tries to talk you out of calling the organization directly, huge, huge red flag that you want to keep out uh, an eye out for. So artificial intelligence is really scary right now. Luckily, it's not that great. But I don't know if you saw the article, there was a, a news story not too long ago about a fake hostage situation. So what had happened was a young woman was on vacation in Mexico and her grandmother got a voicemail that was supposedly from the granddaughter. And basically the granddaughter told her, I've been kidnapped, you need to send $10,000 to this, this bank and, and kind of went through the whole thing. And some of the news stories, they linked the actual audio and it sounded like the granddaughter. The only problem was they had taken the audio from her Facebook, uh, you know, videos that she had posted while she was on vacation, which, you know, she sounds happy and excited. Well, somebody who's just been kidnapped probably isn't gonna sound happy and excited. So that's what clued the grandmother in to that this was a scam. So right now, not that uh, it's not as easy to fall for those. And we're gonna talk about that in prevention. Dropping out again, Doug.
Hello, can you hear me now? Now I can. Yep, you about okay. 10 seconds. Awesome. Yep. So what I was saying is I was about to jump ahead to social media, but I'll wait until we get to the actual slide. But I want to get to password. As computers have gotten stronger, what used to be a good password now might not be. To me, if I have a eight digit password that uses uppercase, lowercase, and a symbol, I always thought about that as a strong password. But now, as you can see from this chart, uh, today's computers could brute force hack that in about five minutes. So you want to add digits to it. Once you get in the, the teens, you're pretty well protected. And I know this isn't that exciting, right? The idea of, oh, I need a 15 digit password that has all these different things in it. I use the same strategy here that I talked about when I talked about public Wi-Fi. I'm less concerned about, let's say my YouTube or my, uh, I don't even know if YouTube has a password, my, my uh, Netflix password, but my financial accounts, I use strong passwords. And one other tip, use different passwords for each of those. One of the big password scams is people will set up you know, websites themselves that make you use a username or password, or they'll hack low secured websites, and then they'll use those usernames and passwords, they'll check them across the board. So they might set up like a little website that just asks you to log in, and then everybody who does, they'll change, they'll take all those usernames and passwords and run them through all the big banks, all the big brokerage accounts, and and see how that that goes. So we're coming into our final stages here. One of the things I'm going to recommend, we're not going to talk about uh, ransomware. For the things that you don't want to lose, like your personal photos and videos, backing those up just in case you lose your computer, really good idea. So social media, I told you I'd talk about it. Don't consider not posting things that give away too much data about yourself. I had a friend who was on vacation in Europe last week kept seeing beautiful pictures of her husband and her in Portugal. That tells everybody who can see their Facebook that they're not at home, that you could break in uh, to their house. So I'm not saying don't post your vacation pictures, but consider posting your vacation pictures after you get home. That's what actually happened to that girl with the fake hostage situation in Mexico. So social media scams, I'm not gonna run through these because they're the exact same scams we've been talking about other than the online one, but I already covered that. So what do we wanna say in closing? Always initiate the interaction yourself. I talked about that a ton. Use strong passwords. And then if you've already been a victim of a scam, getting your money back can actually be, I'm not gonna say impossible, but difficult. It is easier to get your money back if you used a credit card. If you wired somebody money or used a debit card, it is harder. And the last thing I'd say there is if you're a victim, particularly for the really intrusive scams, there are serious mental health impacts that can be associated with that, particularly the romance scams or when you lose a large amount of money, it is very similar, the police say, to being burglarized, that sense of, of, of victimhood. So if that happens and you're struggling with that or you even want help with that, the two things that I would suggest you do, your employee assistance program through work can help there if that's an option, and also victims associations and your local police department often have uh, assistance there because it's a crime, just like any other crime, how people react to that is the same. So with that, 
I want to thank you for your time and attention. Uh, I'll turn it back over to Jeff to close it out. Oh, that, that's great, Doug. So, such good content, quite, quite a bit, a lot, lot to process. So uh, I appreciate you putting the thing about mental health impact. I, I hadn't realized that uh, it, it's, it's becoming an epidemic for, for people that uh, everything from just anxiety and depression to even PTSD, because people feel very violated and unsafe and vulnerable. So uh, if, if that happens to you, definitely seek help. So in light of the, of the, of the kind of, so anybody has any questions, feel free to go use the uh, question box and um, I'll, I'll try to mediate um, as I wait for those though, Doug. So again, you had a good amount of content here. If you could just take one action that's effective and fairly easy to implement, what would you suggest? So this is going to sound like a repeat, but mm -hmm. the biggest step you can take is initiate the contact yourself. There's yeah. no downside to it. Um, it's not going to offend anybody if it's a real contact, but it prevents a huge number of particularly the financial scams to just contact the organization in a way that you know is secure and you're good to go. Excellent. Um, so one of our participants, Lou, asked, can you go back one slide? Uh, so I think he probably wants to take advantage of what he's seeing here. Maybe do, do a screen snap, Lou, to capture those uh, organizations and links. Uh, so in terms of just a, I guess the rule of thumb that I'm, I'm kind of deriving as I listen is become vigilant about anything that's really unsolicited and you just, and trust your gut. If it just doesn't feel right, it's probably not, and that ties in, not right, and that ties into what you're saying. If you're in doubt, go to the source. Absolutely. And it's one of the things that I've heard creates a lot of the psychological stress afterwards because people generally had a gut feeling that something wasn't quite right, but acted on it anyway. So then that adds extra guilt afterwards mm -hmm. or self recrimination. So, you know, yeah, this if only it gets worse. Feel right, it probably isn't. But, and it only gets worse because the sophistication with AI, and you talked about deep fakes. Um, for both video, for audio capture and audio distortion, it's getting almost impossible to discern the difference. So you, you really got to do your, do your very best and be on guard. Um, so you've got any more, no more questions from you? Okay. All right. Well, thank you all for participating. Doug, uh, excellent job. Thank you for uh, sharing your content and your wisdom. We appreciate it. And we'll look forward to speaking with you soon again, maybe on uh, a related topic. And thank awesome. you to the audience. We're gonna we're gonna sign off.